Chris is most proud of the fact that his surety expertise has unlocked nearly a billion dollars in new business opportunities, generating profits that resulted in several dozen entrepreneurs becoming first-time generational millionaires. We also have with us Chris Orview. He is a senior regional surety director for the Cincinnati Insurance Companies. He works with agencies, partners in DC, Northern Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. Chris manages a portfolio of contracting entities within the large contract surety unit for the Cincinnati Insurance Companies. And Chris has experience supporting a wide range of contracting entities in terms of revenue levels and overall scope of work. Thank you, gentlemen, for being a part of WMATA's Small Business Educational Corner today. We're happy to be here. Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm Chris Smith. And since uh, Michelle did such a great job introducing us, we don't have to say anything about ourselves, but there we are. The unique thing about this presentation is I am a surety bond broker. So I represent 40 different bonding companies. And at Anderson Catania, we're bond only. It means every day we only work on bonds, no insurance, no other issues. So that uh, gives us a tremendous advantage in terms of the information that we can gather about what's going on in the universe of bonding companies for small business. And what I want to say is that this presentation is focused on small businesses. We uh, won't go into a lot of detail on some of the intimate, you know, intricate financial analysis that we do today. But what we decided to do was to pick out some best practices that could help a small company either get a first bond or if you have existing bonding capacity, create a scenario where you could increase your bonding capacity by using these best practices. And again, we're focused on Lamont and helping you capture these new business opportunities. So let's start with a real quick snapshot of what a bond is, what it does, and what your relationship looks like with a bonding company. So a surety bond is a three-party agreement. It's a contract between the project owner that asked for the bond. We also call that an obligé, the contractor and the bonding company. And what it essentially guarantees to the owner that requests the bond is that the contract is going to be a fill, fulfilled according to the terms and conditions of that contract. So it's a financial guarantee and it's a risk transfer mecha mechanism for the owner. In this case, WMATA, quasi-government protecting uh, public taxpayer funds that are being used to finance these projects. The uh, interesting part about surety bond and what I want to impress upon you this morning is it's it's a credit relationship. It's technically unsecured credit. What I mean by that is that the surety company, when you when you begin a relationship with a surety company, you present all your financials and your background on your company, your capabilities, and they agree to do business with you and they extend a certain amount of credit they don't take a security interest, they being the bonding company, against the uh, business assets. And that's very different from, say, a bank. A bank, when you go to get a loan, a uh, line of credit or a fixed asset loan, they're looking specifically at the collateral that you can offer to secure that loan. And then they're taking a security interest against that collateral to firm, firm things up. And the way they do that is by putting a UCC lien on the asset or the general assets of the business. So banking is secured credit. Bonding is unsecured credit. Uh, and that's, that's important. That's important because what happens here when you get approved for bonds is the relationship is governed by a funny word, uh, and that word is indemnification. 
And what that means if you're a contractor is when you're on a bonded job, if there's a problem, if there's a claim and that claim results in a financial loss and the bonding company has to step in and cure the claim and, and pay the loss on the bond, you are responsible for making that bonding company financially whole. So that's indemnification in a nutshell. And if you think about it, bonding as a credit relationship and you compare it uh, to uh, uh, insurance, commercial insurance, if you have a claim in the commercial insurance world and it's a covered loss, the commercial insurance company will come in, pay the claim, uh, resolve the claim, and you move on with life. And when your renewal comes up, you may have slightly higher rates. You may have to find another insurance company to cover you, but you don't have to make the insurance company whole. That agreement that you have with the insurance company is two parties, you and the insurance company. So bonding is not insurance. Bonding is not banking. It kind of sits in the middle. And where are you going to see, where are you going to be asked to provide bonds? If you're working on a government project, there are laws that trigger bonding requirements, whether that's federal, state, municipal, local. There's laws that exist that uh, are designed to protect taxpayer funded projects. If you're on the commercial side, it's set the discretion of the entities that are doing business together. But as you might know, a lot of the larger commercial general contractors in the DMV require small subs to bond back their contracts or bond, uh, provide a bond to that commercial general contractor. That's a risk management decision that the commercial general contractor has made. And I've seen uh, one, con one large GC require bonds on projects as small as $50,000. So it can come up, uh, the bonding requirement on very, very small projects. Okay, so this is the best practice basket that we pulled together for you this morning. We're just going to go right into these. Credit scoring. So if you're a small company, one of the easiest things that you can do to position yourself to obtain your first bond or expand your bonding capacity is to pull your credit report and find out where you're scoring and make sure that you understand if there's something negatively impacting your FICO score, your personal credit score, that you're aware of it and you're addressing it. With your FICO score alone and a simplified application, a small business, if they're qualified to do the work, can pull a bond up to $350,000. It, it takes literally two days. It is accessible. So if that's a big job for you and you thought that bonding was a big barrier, it's not. As long as you can present that score. And what is that score? They generally want to see scores in the sick FICO scores in the 650 or higher range. So 650 or higher, you can get into the bonding world. Uh, when the bond company pulls your credit reports, they're going to review the company owner's report. And if the company owner is married, the company owner spouse report. And that's all owners, all spouses. And uh, why do they do that? Because when you enter into that indemnification relationship as a small company, you're going to be required to indemnify corporately or business wise and personally. And that means that your spouse is going to have to sign that indemnification agreement. So what happens if your credit is great and your spouse's credit is absolutely horrible? Well, that's a conversation that we have to have. It's not the end of the world. It's just a conversation. We have to understand what's driving that. If you do not meet the 650 FICO score threshold, it does not mean you can't get a bond. What happens at this point is we've got to dig deeper and we've got to figure out what uh, circumstances led to the lower score. There are credit repair professionals in the market that are very helpful in these situations. What these uh, professionals do is they create a roadmap to uh, score improvement. And for me, uh, 
what it what it does is it shows your level of commitment to improving the score to taking responsibility over the situation and so if your score is sub 650 and you engage one of these credit repair professionals which we we have one that we recommend we can get that information to you later uh it's it's a vote of confidence in the underwriting and there are different programs that are designed to find pathways for individuals that are uh sub 650. Uh, the biggest thing in that conversation is you've got to be transparent you've got to you've got to put it all out there as ugly as it might be and and take ownership over the conversation commercial credit the bonding companies will pull commercial credit that's generally a dmb or dun and bradstreet report or it could be one of the reports that they pull from one of the three uh, typical credit reporting bureaus. The scoring here doesn't work the same way as the FICO scoring. Primarily, the bond underwriters are pulling those reports to see any evidence of a bankruptcy, a lien, or a judgment, whether it's open or historical. So that's where those are going to show up if it's company related, and the underwriters want to know, you know if those things exist. So be upfront. Again, be transparent about any issues you're dealing with the uh, thing about liens so let's say you defaulted on a loan an equipment loan i'm i'm actually working on one of these right now individual uh, had a bond claim it was a very small bond claim and that bond claim essentially turned the business upside down for a short period of time and the individual had equipment loans that were uh, taken out to support the type of work that they were performing those equipment loans defaulted due to the bond claim, and uh, it just got messy very quickly. This individual, instead of just letting it go, he set up installment plans, and he has been for a couple years now making regular installment payments against those defaulted loans. It's, an, it's called an installment agreement. And because he had showed uh, good stewardship of the situation, because he could evidence the payments on those uh, defaulted loans through the installment agreement, the surety, with the help of an SBA guarantee, is willing to consider bond, uh, a new bond opportunity. And so even if you have a lien or you defaulted on a loan, if you can evidence that you are chipping away at that loan, you may not be locked out of accessing bonds. And this goes too for tax liabilities. So let's say you're behind on your taxes and you're paying those uh, liabilities down and you, the IRS has approved an installment agreement for you. You can leverage that to have a conversation about bonding. So uh, don't give up and uh, just be transparent about what you're dealing with. Here's a contractor example, and this is real. We had a low 500 FICO score come through for a low voltage electrical sub. This sub wanted to pursue an opportunity. It was a fi around 500,000 to a public school in the Midwest, and this individual was not getting much attention from the bond universe. So we went to work. We found out there were some uh, student loans that hadn't been paid and some medical bills that were pretty long pays. So they, uh, the amounts weren't that big, but the owner just, he just wasn't doing what he needed to do. This is a situation where we brought the credit repair professional in. They did, uh, they, they looked at everything. They determined that it was a recoverable story. The credit repair professional was engaged and in this case, uh, the individual had some personal cash saved. So we were able to leverage the engagement of the credit repair professional and evidence the personal cash that was in savings to get that bond approved. This company was running just about five, six hundred thousand in top line revenue in the prior 12 months. So with a little bit of extra work, with a, a stronger commitment to get that credit under control um, we, and, and with engaging that outside credit repair professional, we were able to get 
that bond approved. And that is highly unusual. In fact, that's the first low 500 FICO uh, score bond approval that I've ever uh, been involved with in my 17 years. So this example impressed on me that every contractor should have an opportunity to tell their story. And contract construction is unpredictable and it's risky and things happen. So don't give up if you're dealing with one of these situations. Okay, uh, this one is uh, another tactical best practice. This is what bigger companies do every day. Small companies uh, often don't do this as well or, or you don't think it's as important, but it is. And what I'm talking about here is bringing your key personnel into a spotlight and presenting them to the bond company in a way that, that can enhance your ability to grow your bonding capacity. And so what does this mean in simple terms? This means that you're keeping a current resume or biography on all your key people. <clears throat> you're going into their histories, even their histories prior to their employment with your company to pull out in more detail, not just, hey, I worked here from this date to that date, and these were my general responsibilities. Really go back into their past project performance portfolios and pick out those large projects that we, they worked on. Pick out their responsibilities on that project and, and treat that as a selling point for your company. And here's where I've used this. Let's say you, you, your largest job that you've completed is 1 million and you want to go to three, three and a half million. Well, that's a pretty big stretch for a small company and it has to make business sense. So there's, there's a quantitative explanation and that's the financial end of it. And there's a qualitative explanation for why a, a jump like that might make sense. And that's uh, this, this management talent piece is part of the qualitative. What that means is, can you manage a project that large? Does your organization have the capacity to add that much volume and still be successful? And where do we go with that? Right to your management talent. So if you can show, maybe not in, the, in your company, but the collection of your key personnel, pulling detailed histories on those personnel somewhere in their past that they had managed a three, three and a half, or even larger project, and, and that they have that experience, we can use that to support the business case for you stretching into larger projects. And so this is totally under your control and totally beneficial to the conversation about bonding. Uh, the best way that I've seen to frame this for a bond underwriter is to create an organization chart. It does not have to be complicated. It just has to reflect reality. And reality means uh, the chart follows the way that you run your business, your business process, the roles and responsibilities, and the decision making. So that's not difficult. You know who has authority to make decisions. Just make sure that if you present a organization chart in a bonding conversation, that you can walk through that chart and match it up to the way things get done at your company. So um, let me give you an example of how we use this recently. So this, this actually just happened last week. Uh, a, chief, a chief estimator was hired at a company that's doing roughly 10, 12 million top line. This is a small minority owned company. This was literally a number one draft pick hire. This was a big hire. This gentleman has uh, a lot of years of industry experience and he had facilitated uh, fairly uh, rapid growth for a small company, grew them to about 50 million top line profitably and, and was a central nerve in terms of that growth story. So this individual that I represent wooed that individual. He liked what he saw. Uh, and he liked the way that this individual ran the company, he liked the aspirational goals that he uh, was pursuing. And don't forget that too in your management talent. You as a small company, you, you, you can grow often larger than medium or large size companies. And talented people will be attracted to that 
to that opportunity. So this individual, uh, we got the, again, we pulled the bio, the resume, we got his past performance portfolio fleshed out, and we are now going to present that to the bond underwriter as a key hire. We're gonna show how he fits into the organization, what his responsibilities are, and we're really gonna highlight his past uh, performance on that growth story to 50 million so that when the new work comes, because remember, he's, br he's bringing new relationships too. So we anticipate more revenue. So we're setting up this growth story with the underwriter and we're doing it by presenting it from a talent standpoint and by reinforcing that the company has the management strength to grow profitably. So this management talent doesn't seem like a big deal, but it is a really big deal if you're in growth mode. And if you're in growth mode, you have to have goals. You have to keep the thing moving in the right direction. And this is another thing that small companies have complete control over. And it makes a difference. And it surprises me how many companies don't set goals or don't set specific goals and then don't work on clearly and concisely communicating those goals to their bond companies or to other creditors like banks, suppliers, whatever it is. This is an easy one. You, you have an aspirational goal and you communicate that goal with enthusiasm in a bond meeting or on a Zoom or uh, in a virtual setting. And you do that at least once a year, maybe twice a year if you're growing rapidly. And what does that do for you really? Um, well, actually, let me, let me say something before I go there. What, is that, what could that goal be in a conversation? It could be a, a target market that you want to pursue. It could be uh, how you will differentiate yourself as a company in the marketplace. It could be a top line revenue goal. It could be a bottom line revenue goal. It could be uh, capital investment in uh, property or a building or piece of equipment that you think is going to move your business forward. So there are a lot of different goals. Uh, whatever it is, put it together, treat it like a pitch, treat it like something that's really important to communicate to a creditor and it will be well received. So why is this important? Because I have seen with small businesses, especially small businesses that are in growth mode, that if you communicate the goal, you drive goal attainment. You drive contribution by not just me, but the bond company underwriter, the decision maker on the other side that is extending credit to you. And that's important because you're going to run into projects where they're just outside of your approved bonding capacity limits, but it makes total business sense to pursue those opportunities to you. And so these are the little details that fill in. And if they knew that you were heading in that direction and it makes sense, it aligns with your goal, they're more likely going to want to find a path to help you grab that stretch approval, grab that, you know, that stretch or larger opportunity. The other thing you can do here when you're communicating your goals is communicate those goals to your outside advisors. And when you're in a bonding relationship, what we're talking about is your accountant, your attorney, your banker, maybe another consultant, primarily. And these are the, uh, in, including me, the surety broker, these are the four horsemen, if you will. These are the people that support informed decision making and help de-risk uh, situations for you. So. You want to be communicating your goals to those individuals for the same reasons that you want to be communicating with your surety broker and uh, with your surety bond underwriter. And that's contribution to goal attainment and advisory, helping you make the best informed decisions that you can make to achieve that goal. One other thing uh, that I want to say is small companies don't often get to talk to the underwriter one-on-one. -on -one. Today we have a uh, a beautiful situation. We actually have Chris Corvo, who's a decision maker. He's, he's the guy at the bonding company that makes the approval decision. So we're going to hear from him later. And uh, that's uh, going to compliment what I'm saying. But if you're not in a conversation at least once a year, maybe even twice a year, and if you're in serious growth mode, 
at least quarterly with that bond underwriter, whether it be virtual, in person, you need to be, even if you're small, because it, um, it makes a difference in the decision-making process from the bond company side. They know you, you get to build rapport, you get to build trust, and it, it really does influence these decisions. So if you're not getting that, you need to ask for that. Okay, financial reporting. This is the one where uh, we're going to go in a little bit more detail, but um, we're gonna hit it high level and we're gonna break it down based on uh, job size. And what I wanna say before we get into this is, so I've been doing this for 17 years. This is the best of the best of times for small businesses in terms of your ability to access bonding credit, your ability to get your first bond, your ability to grow your bonding capacity. Over the last couple of years, there has been a shift in the bonding universe. And, and what has happened is a lot of bonding companies are, are uh, coming downstream, are more willing to work with small companies. They have created more flexible underwriting requirements for small companies. So if you are going to make a run and you want to grow your bonding capacity, this is the time. It won't last. It's cyclical. Uh, but it is a very, very favorable environment for small business right now in terms of access to bonding. So financial reports, this is another one that's under your control. And really what it is, is timely and accurate reports. And when we're talking about financial reports, we're typically talking about a balance sheet, a profit and loss statement, an aging of the accounts receivable that is shown on the balance sheet. And if you get into some larger jobs, a work in progress report, a work in progress schedule. The size of the project will dictate the um, type of financial report that you have to produce and the, um, the whether or not an, an external CPA is going to have to come in and produce that report. So let's start with single projects up to 350, like we talked about, 350,000. Uh, that one, you're not going to have to generally produce any uh, financial report. Again, we said it's a simplified application and it's a FICO credit score that gets that done. So I, I was looking at the Wilmata website. There are plenty of projects that are in that 350,000 and less. I know we're going to talk about that later. So that one, if you're, if you're thinking about that size segment and you don't have bonds, and you don't know if you're going to need bonds, I would encourage you to go ahead and get pre-qualified. It does not cost you anything to get pre-qualified for bonds. The only time that you incur expenses for uh, bond pre-qualification is if you actually get a contract and you are awarded that job and we have to issue bonds. So for readiness, I would go ahead and get pre-qualified. For 350 up to 2 million, generally QuickBooks will carry it in the current environment. It wasn't always that way. So this is an accrual basis. QuickBooks financial statement, again, balance sheet, profit and loss, accounts receivable aging. As you get up to that 2 million level, you're probably going to be asked to provide a work in progress schedule. And um, so we're going to talk about that in a minute, but it's, it's a little more uh, reporting. It has to be accurate. It doesn't have to be the best QuickBooks report that ever existed but the numbers have to reconcile and it has to be accurate. So uh, if you don't know how to do that or you're doing it yourself and you want to make sure that you make a good first impression on a bonding company, have a bookkeeper look at, at it, have an accountant look at it, just to make sure that your books are reconciling for the activity in the company for that period of time and the prior year. It's really, really important. And it's, it's easy. It's easy to... Um, to make a great first impression on a bonding company. So over 2 million, and this is where you start to get into a situation where you've got multiple jobs running at once, probably those are unbonded and bonded jobs. So the bonding company is going to extend you an aggregate amount of bonding capacity. We call it an aggregate backlog limit. And so you'll have 
the ability to pursue a single project at some level, let's say a million, within an aggregate backlog of, let's say, three million. Um, and so what you're doing is you're constantly shuffling bonded and unbonded jobs through that backlog of work, and you are managing your bonding capacity uh, based on your cost to complete, your cost to complete. So let's come back to the WIP report because this is this is how you get this is how you get to the point where you're you know you have a good ability to manage your available bonding capacity. So the WIP report tracks your cost to complete on your uncompleted projects. Cost to complete is the same thing or the same word as backlog in the bonding universe. So when we say backlog or aggregate backlog limit for your bonding capacity. We're talking about your cost to complete on your uncompleted projects. The WIP report is the report where you track your billings to date on those jobs. You, tack, you track your cost to date on those jobs and you track your cost to complete on those pro, uh, projects. It'll also show you from a timing standpoint whether you're heavily overbilled or underbilled on a project. And you can use that as a flag to determine whether there, there are any payer issues on that job or whether you know you have accurately uh, captured all of your costs uh, if you're heavily overbilled on a project. So there's a lot of data coming out, out of this report. We're going to send out, if you're interested, a sample report so that you can see what it looks like. It really is not complicated to populate. Uh, the WIP report, it is factually one of the most important reports in the bonding relationship. And again, it'll give you that all important cost to complete on your open projects. And that is what you, you know, that's how you measure how much bonding capacity you have available. It's also a number that if we have to stretch the program, increase it to grab a good opportunity, it's the number that we use to see where you are at that point in time. So it's really important to get this, this WIP report populated as you get into these larger projects. Um, and yeah, what you're gonna find out inevitably is that the CPA relationship that you have, the quality of the reporting that you're able to produce is there's a direct line to whether or not that CPA is construction savvy whether or not that CPA works with small construction companies or other uh, contracting entities that are serving WMATA. And it shows up all the time in these reports. And, and a lot of the complexity comes into play when you're looking at job costing. How are you accounting for your direct job costs? How are you allocating indirect job costs to each project? And, and how is that reflected in your financial reports. And if you don't know how to do that, you need to get help because if you are in growth mode, it will be, you know, your, your lack of knowledge, your lack of your uh, ability to pull accurate uh, reports through will be exposed very, very quickly. So if you're already working with the CPA and they're using, or they're preparing your tax uh, returns, that's fine. You don't have to switch that necessarily. If they are not construction savvy, I would encourage you to add another CPA and, and start to work on your financial reporting and your job costing process in con consultation with that construction savvy CPA. It's, it's very, very important. So here's an example that happened two weeks ago. And it's, it's a contractor, about 11 and a half in gross revenue. Uh, contractor reviewed his second quarter in-house QuickBooks financial statements, income statement was flat, and he was concerned about your end profitability and bonding capacity, and he was just nervous as a relatively new small business owner that had a couple of strong years. He, he finally saw some data that was a little bit scary. So to his credit, he we met for lunch. He, he said he wanted to talk about it, and he was asking questions, well, what happens if I'm, you know, if I have a net loss for the period? How does that affect my bonding? Or what happens if I have a relatively large 
net loss for the period. So I could tell he was nervous and he was going through these scenarios in his head. So what I suggested was that he pull a current whip and he pull his uh, inside and his field management team together and they do an exhaustive line by line of all the uncompleted projects and they focus the conversation around the estimated cost to complete. They pull in the project schedules and they get a really accurate snapshot of what work could be run off uh, by the end of the year, what the cost to complete estimates look like, anything, any kind of variable that could affect their ability to complete that work before the end of the year, and then work those numbers back through the whip to come up with the remaining profit that was left to earn in their uh, schedule of uncompleted contracts or in their whip schedule. And they did it. And this was the first time that they did it, and they did it beautifully. And he texted me and he said, we went through the, the CTC, the cost to complete analysis in great detail. And what we learned was that not only do we have enough profit left to earn for the rest of the year to cover our overhead, but we've got surplus profits. And so we're heading towards profitability. And I asked him, you know, was this a kind of conversation that you would regularly have with your team? And again, this is a small business. And he said, no. And he said, this was a next level conversation. This guy's not an account. He's not a finance guy per se. Uh, he's a field guy that is talented and in growing his company. So these are things that you can do as a small business. And I know Chris Corbo is on the call and maybe he'll acknowledge this later. But if you can do this in a bonding meeting, it will blow the hair back on the bond underwriter because many small companies uh, don't take the time or cannot perform this in-house review. It's a big deal. And it is a very, very impressive thing to execute in a bond meeting. Okay, we're getting close to hearing from Chris uh, Corbeau. Bank line of credit. This is another thing that you can do, even if you don't have to use it right away, to show a bonding company that you're anticipating growth, to show a bonding company that you are, uh, you, know, you have good knowledge of what your working capital needs might be, and to show that there is another creditor, in this case, a secured creditor, a bank, that has looked at the business, that sees financial footing, you know, good financial footing, and that has extended credit. And what we recommend in terms of the amount of uh, bank line that you need is 10% of your backlog. Okay, 10, remember, backlog is cost to complete. So 10% of that backlog should be covered by a bank line of credit. And why is it 10%? Well, generally, retention is sitting at 10% on projects. So you're having to complete the job and wait for some warranty period uh, six, you know, three, six months later to capture all of your retention. You might get a little early release on some, but it's still hanging out there. So we we recommend that while you're waiting for that, in case you need it, you set up the line of credit to cover 10% of your backlog. So if you're in growth mode, maybe that's your your backlog at the you know at the end of this fiscal year that you were targeting. If you're pretty steady, you know what what your backlog looks like. Uh, the other thing I would say, and this doesn't come up in banking conversations often. I don't know why, because it's important. But uh, when you leave this conversation, you will be an informed decision maker. When banks do these lines of credit, sometimes they will look at the collateral that you are providing uh, and they will uh, set up the loan agreement so that there is a what's called a borrowing base or a pool of collateral that you can draw against on the loan. And that value of that pool of collateral is comprised of the assets that the banker pulls in for collateral, whether it be cash, accounts receivable, equipment, whatever it is. A lot of times for small companies, it is your accounts receivable. The, uh, so let's say you have a million dollars in accounts receivable and you're pledging that um, against your line of credit and the banker is extending some amount of line of credit against that for you to borrow at any given point in time. 
the bankers do not, I haven't seen this yet. If it exists, somebody put it in the notes, but the bankers uh, will not lend 100% against bonded receivables. So if you have bonded and unbonded projects running at one point in time, you will find out if, if, if you have a conversation very quickly that the bankers either do not lend on those bonded receivables or they lend a very small percentage against those bonded receivables. And why is that? Well, banks do not have first lien rights on bonded projects. They have second lien. That means that if something goes wrong, the banks are behind the bonding companies on bonded jobs. And banks don't like that. And that's why they don't lend against bonded receivables. So you need to understand if that's going to constrain your ability to borrow against your line of credit. And you need to be able to plan against any possible constraint. Here we are, the surety relationship. So this, again, is a unique opportunity. We're going to hear from Chris Corvo. And this is, this is one guy that makes the, the approval decisions, some small ones, some big ones, been in the industry a long time, seen a lot of different contracting operations. And Chris, if you would take over and uh, appreciate you being here. Of course. Thank you, Chris. Great presentation. As mentioned earlier, this is Chris Corvo with the Cincinnati Insurance Companies. I manage a portfolio of contracting entities through working with agency partners located in Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. In short, my role within the company is to underwrite or analyze both the quantitative and qualitative risk factors of a contracting entity with the responsibility of accepting or declining risk through issuance of bid bonds or ultimately performance and payment bonds on behalf of both existing and new contracting entities for Cincinnati. As Chris covered earlier, a bond essentially guarantees to the obligee that the third party surety will fulfill the principal's contractual obligation to that obligee if the principal fails to do so. At a high level, I tend to describe to others that the approval of a performance and payment bond is driven by the surety company's belief that their principal on the bond the contracting entity, whether a general contractor or subcontractor supplier, will show up to work each day and ultimately fulfill their con contractual obligations to the owner through project completion. The loss experience for performance and payment bonds is quite different than, say, auto insurance. Auto insurance is considered high frequency, yet fortunately, low severity. Performance and payment bond loss experience is the opposite, in that losses tend to be lower frequency but significantly higher severity. We all know that the construction industry is full of risk and uncertainty. So yes, typically being an unsecured creditor, there are certain capital requirements that the surety industry looks for. Rather than spell out these quantitative or capital requirements, I feel that it would be much more beneficial for the audience to hear how contracting entities can maximize their surety program through developing a surety relationship built on trust. Again, remember, that in guaranteeing the principal's performance through the issuance of a performance and payment bond, the surety can face severe financial penalties if the principal's obligations are not met. Therefore, it is in the best interest of both the principal and surety that the principal's obligations to the obligee are met. The best and most fruitful surety relationships are built on trust. Chris did an excellent job earlier covering numerous aspects of what makes a strong surety relationship. There is a significant amount of time and effort that goes into the initial and continued underwriting of a new potential contracting entity or existing relationship. So similar to Chris, we believe that the principal surety relationship should come with a view of being long term partners. Personally, rather than dictate your business plan, I prefer to look at the relationship in terms of how can I support your business plan? It is important to meet with both new and existing accounts to understand their goals and aspirations. This way, we can both be aligned when it comes to expectations of each other. Those meetings do not end at what one can consider the first date, as yearly or semi-annual meetings help build the relationship and keep the surety apprised of ever-changing wants and needs in a business environment full of continued uncertainty. Fostering a relationship built on trust with your surety can certainly maximize your bonding capacity. This applies to all contractors, including newer or small business entities. Building a relationship with your surety partner rather than looking at it with a transactional viewpoint can help greatly 
but some of the financial or quantitative underwriting factors don't quite meet general standards. Some of the situations I'll be outlining next might require the surety to take a leap of faith predicated on their belief and trust that you, the principal, will satisfy your contractual obligations to the Albagie. Does your business plan include the future desire to pursue larger projects? As Chris mentioned, informing your surety partner as soon as possible allows both parties to understand the needs and desires of each other. The surety may want to see additional profit retained in the company down the line to act as a liquidity buffer in case you encounter unsuspected issues or speed bumps as you pursue that larger project. Also, as Chris mentioned, this goes along with developing banking relationships for a potential line of credit to support the immediate need for liquidity or injection of cash. It's important to share why you desire to pursue these larger projects. Is it for a familiar owner of yours? Do you have a competitive advantage that separates you from other entities that may be pursuing the project? Do you have an experienced team of a joint venture partner or subcontractor relationships that you will be working with on this project? Did you recently bring on board a new employee with a specialty in managing work at this increased magnitude? Outlining all of these factors to your surety may improve the surety's comfort level that you can successfully prosecute this new milestone project. Are you contemplating territory or scope expansion? The, more, the majority of the questions I just outlined related to pursuit of a larger project can also apply to territory and scope expansion. In addition to those, have you discussed with your surety what makes this new territory or scope attractive? Or is it simply a single occurrence related to a relationship that you have with an owner or other contracting entity? Are you pursuing this new territory or scope as a team approach with other familiar GCs, subcontractors, or suppliers? Will you engage outside report, uh, support to review new potential contract language? Outlining all of these factors can help your surety gain comfort in your ability to sex successfully prosecute the work outside of your standard operating territory or scope. On the flip side, developing a long-term surety partner can assist in situations when you encounter a problem project. Do you have a history of following through on prior expectations set with your surety? Do you provide them timely and reliable information? Do you have a history of completing work on time? Is the surety able to verify this through a history of work in progress schedules outlined on a CPA statement, as Chris covered earlier? Do you inform your surety partner as soon as you discover these potential issues, or do you wait for them to notice these issues through information received at a later date? Informing your surety of the issues and your plan for mitigating those issues as early as possible should bolster the surety's belief that you can manage through that problem project, therefore resulting in continued bonding support. At the end of the day, the best surety relationships are treated as a team approach by the contracting entity, the surety agent, and the surety company. With that being said, Chris and I thank you all for your time today. I know we might have a question or two, so we'll send that back to Chris. Do we have some questions? Hi, I believe we do have one question and one question was uh, how do you apply for bonding once you have a contract? Uh, going back to the comments, it's it's going to be driven by the size of the contract. So. Again, let's just run through if you're under 350,000, you, you know, we'll send you an application. We'll Pull the credit scores and it'll be very, very quick. If you're 350 to 2 million, it's a little bit more uh, information, but it's still, you know, three to five business days and, and we would outline the information. So that would be uh, likely, you know, an in house QuickBooks financial statement, tax returns, personal financial statement, a simplified application, and then uh, you know, we'd have to review all the contract award documents. So if it gets over two million, again, that's where we're 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 entering the traditional bond underwriting process, and that can be more involved in terms of 
data collection. So it depends on the size of the job. Chris, we have another question. Do you need past performance in order to get bonding? This is what we were really focusing on this morning. And so the simple answer is yes, you should bring it, but it could come from different sources. And so it, um, it could be within your own organization. It could be in a prior employ employment scenario. It could be brought forward through a teaming uh, or a joint venture relationship. It, um, you've got to show that you're qualified to do the work and that you can execute the work. So how you pull that story through is, uh, it's not black and white. There are different pathways to getting a bond approved in terms of your past performance. I would say the smaller the job, let's, let's go back to that 350 and under, you know, your past performance, it, 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 is, it is reviewed, it isn't as strenuously reviewed, but you have to show that you're qualified to do the work. So again, if you're unsure about uh, where you are, it, you need to have a conversation with somebody like me and you need to flesh out a pathway to evidencing to your best ability, your qualifications. Do you want to add anything to that, Chris? Yes, spot on. I mean, you know, really for, for the audience, uh, I think the, the question was, how do you apply for a bond? Um, really, the first individual to contact would be an insurance or a surety bond agent such as Chris. And, you know, Chris can walk you through the process from there. Again, depending on the actual bond amount, it could be a simple application and a credit score. Or, you know, as that, that bond amount or that contract size increases, so does the additional need for the surety or myself. Um, again, because as that liability that I'm taking on increases, I need to, to ensure you know, that I'm comfort comfortable with, you know, that project um, and your overall organization. Um, Next question is, is bonding just for construction companies? The, this, uh, the participant says they're a wholesale and trade company and buy lots of products for resale. Yeah, so no, bonding is not just limited to construction. And in fact, uh, uh, commonly, we'll, we'll, we will uh, look at situations where uh, it, it's both goods and services, where you might have a large supply contract for some kind of product. Uh, or you, one example on the service side that is coming up more frequently is you're in IT and you do network infrastructure and you, uh, maybe you, you're a, um, integrator, so you're tying in whatever the hardware and software needs are of your customer into an existing environment. Well, those types of uh, projects can require bonds too. So, uh, and then there's a whole other universe of bonds that you may need when you're setting up your company for licensing, uh, for example, general contractor's license, or if you're an environmental, there's all sorts of licensing for uh, abatement work, and remediation work. So there are many, many different types of bonds. And if you're unsure about whether or not you will need bonding, uh, just you know, get in touch with someone like me and we can walk through the various scenarios. And what I would encourage you to do is just ask your customer. You know, use, use the small business office at WMATA, use it as an opportunity to you know, make an impression on them in terms of your company, your capabilities, but also use it as an opportunity to not waste time pursuing bonding if you're going to be uh, looking at WMATA opportunities and there's no history of WMATA requiring bonds on those opportunities. You may have just answered this one. I'll pose it anyway. Uh, we are not a contractor. We provide trucking. Does the same apply for equipment purchases? Um, as far as you're going to, is it as far as you're going to, to purchase a truck and you are asking if the, the reseller is going to ask you to bond that purchase or something else? We 
may if they clarify in the chat then we'll revisit if we have time okay. let me just get not... uh, yeah let's just quickly hit both of those the the reseller let's say it's john deere uh, or cat they're not going to ask you for a bond um, you're either going to finance that purchase through their resources or through your own resources uh, or cash so uh, that's I rarely do we see bonds on that end of it. Uh, as far as delivering trucking services, it can be bonded. It can be bonded. And it's usually triggered on large scale projects, mostly in you know, a horizontal type projects. And it's usually triggered by the commercial prime, not the owner. So a big GC, a big, uh, you know, Heavy highway GC, you know, you're gonna, you're going to uh, be moving dirt or you know, whatever it is. Uh, they may require you to bond, but it's not as common as the other construction trades. Next question: Are bonds free or are they loans? And what are the interest rates? <laughs> That's a good, okay. Um, Bonds are bonds are not. I don't know. I've never heard it put that way. That's why I'm smiling. So when we're talking about the expense of obtaining a bond, we have to think bigger than just the premium, and we have to go back to the job size, right? So you've got to put time into this thing, and as you tip up over that two million dollar mark, you're going to have to invest in financial statements from an outside construction savvy. CPA. So, and, you know, there may be other uh, internal process changes that you have to make so that you can produce the information that is required, the underwriting information, to look at those larger bonded projects. So, uh, bonding is not free in that context. When you actually, from a practical standpoint, when you're actually in the process of pre qualifying for bonds, our end of it, the brokerage end of it, the Anderson and Catania surety services end of it. We do that work. We do that frontline underwriting. We position you in the best light and we match you up with the bonding company that we feel based on many, many years of experience will be most supportive to you in the execution of your business plan. So all of that work, which is quite a bit of work, as Chris said earlier, we don't charge for that work initially, not even for a bid bond that you may need for an opportunity. What we do is we do that work. We share all of our expertise with an understanding that we're, we're on the front end of a long-term relationship. We're building a relationship that over time, you will pull more bonds. We'll be able to create revenue for our agency and you'll be able to hit your goals and, and do, do what you want to do as well. So initially when you're pre-qualifying, no cost. If you bid a job and you win the job, the depending on what the requirements are, you could need a performance and payment bond. And at that point, we would uh, we would uh, uh, we would charge. And the charge is a rate that gets applied to your bonds, and that rate is determined by uh, uh, the bonding company and to a large degree you and how well you present your company and how many of these best practices that we're talking about this morning you've employed and worked on and, and polished you know your presentation so it if you were coming into this and you were thinking that bonding was just a balance sheet conversation or it was just a credit score you know situation hopefully this conversation has changed your mind that there are a lot of factors that have nothing to do with your balance sheet that can influence your ability to pull a bond and, and ultimately influence the rate that you pay for those bonds. So the rate will range anywhere from just less than 1% to 3% generally, depending on the risk profile of your company. Chris, when you spoke about Dun & Bradstreet, will it help if you pay to have them update your company report and profile? Chris Corvo, you wanna take that one? Sure. Um, <clears throat> You know, one 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 piece with the Dun and Bradstreet, and there's there's numerous other business um, reports. As Chris mentioned, you know, it, it's really an accumulation of public data. 
So, you know, really uh, on the underwriting side, really regardless of your bond amount, that is most likely going to be reviewed on a yearly basis. Um, and again, this is business credit from uh, public reporting agencies, not personal credit. Personal credit is not discussed. Um, it's just the business credit. So again, if there's anything negative on there that could potentially hinder bonding support, we're going to call the bonding agent you know, to set up a meeting to discuss with the client, the contractor, the contracting entity. You know, This is what we've seen. And, you know, hopefully, um, you know, that can get taken of very quickly. So, again, if there's something negative on the report that appears, um, you know, hopefully it will be addressed to you and you can get that cleared up. That way your bonding capacity is not impacted in, in any negative way. Um, so. And I'll just add one thing to that, that it's pretty well understood that on the commercial side, especially with Dun & Bradstreet, that the contractor can play a big role in influencing that score, which I did. Now that is somewhat confusing to me because then it's not necessarily an independent report uh, or independent representation of the credit. So some people call that pay to play. And I think that's the where you're coming from on that question. Uh, I think that what Chris is saying is the score is not weighing in as heavily as the the issues on the report, those, you know, the tax liens, the judgments, the bankruptcies, anything like that. So it's up to you to own that conversation. Um, so I wouldn't worry about the score as much as I would worry about what's on that report. I think this is going to probably be our last question. In all unanswered questions, we will uh, email them out in the FAQ um, following this presentation um, this week. Uh, last question we're going to have time for is, you mentioned that it would be good to get pre-qualified for bonds. Do you just find any bond company or are there specific ones we should look into? There are specific companies, depending on where you are entering into the conversation and the risk profile of your company. So the pathway is you would contact an individual like me, uh, a surety bond agent, and that agent would uh, help you identify which bonding program is best for you. So the first step, in my view, is to pull your personal credit score so that you know what's going on in that report if it's small, if we're talking about a small job and you're prepared, you're, you're informed and you're prepared uh, to, uh, to share with the, the bond broker, bond agent, where you're coming in on your credit. Uh, and then you know it's up to that individual to decide the best path forward in terms of which bonding company could best support you. But it's not complicated. It really is more, uh, it's more about you uh, being prepared and informed so that we can make quick work of it and get you going. Chris Smith and Chris Corvo, thank you so much. Uh, we just want to uh, really just thank you for all that you all this information that you've been able to give us and uh, we look forward to uh, uh, seeing you in a few months.